Okay, it's like it's time to get started. And it's like technical glitch and before starting, but I think things are going okay now. Are there any questions? There's one, yes. Uh, Professor, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So, um, sorry if I missed it, but can you please talk about uh, how much weightage would the exam have, the projects have, and the assignments have, and how many total assignments would there be in this course? Um, actually, that's in the syllabus, and I don't have it in front of me right now. Um, I we're not going to have any more assignments um, because the semester is almost over um, and I'm feeling that people are getting a little bit stressed out with all the work um, there were a couple other questions on the chat um, about this new grading system So the university decided that um, because students are feeling perhaps stressed out, couldn't have good access to classes, et cetera, they're willing to do several things. One is they've extended the, the basically the drop dates. So you can drop a class and I forget which, you know, one date was May 1st and one was May 7th. Um, so you can still drop a class. Um, they also allow students to take a course credit, no credit. Um, if you're thinking of doing that, you have to think very carefully about it because there are some downsides. So the first downside is um, when you take a course credit, no credit, uh, normally you cannot use that class uh, that course on your POS. Um, they're willing to allow that this time. Um, but a, pet, a credit on credit course, credit um, means you get a B or better in the course. So if you get a B minus, a C plus or a C, um, that means no credit, which means it doesn't count towards your degree. Um, also, the credit, no credit, does not affect your um, GPA in any way. So if you're um, trying to raise your GPA, taking a course, credit, no credit, um, will not help. The only time it seems to make sense is if you're going to get less than a C grade in a class, um, if, you, if you're getting less than a C grade of a graduate student, the course will not count towards your degree. Um, and this way, if you do credit, no credit, um, you won't take your GPA down. You have to make sure that you find financial aid. You have to make sure that it won't affect that. Um, that's what I know about um, Credit, no credit. And Mo, you had a question? Uh, so the remaining the remaining marks would be like distributed evenly with uh, between the two assignments that we have done so far, one exam and project? Correct. Okay, so which one would be more heavy, the exam or the project? Um, again, that's set in the syllabus. Okay. Yeah, uh, I was looking at the syllabus the last week. I don't remember it correctly, but the exam, against the exam, it said 25%, and against the project, it said 20%. So, would the ratio remain the same? Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Any other questions?
Okay, then I got a question before I start. Um, how many people, once they finished the first part of the exam, then downloaded the latest data set to see whether or not we've reached a peak or not? You cut off for me. Can you repeat the question? The question is, how many people, once they finished the first part of the exam, then download the latest version of the data set to get more data? No one thought of doing that to see whether or not in the last two weeks things have changed. Well, this weekend when you um, have a bit more time, you want to try that, see if how, how things have changed in the last two weeks. Okay, well, that's get started. And there we go. I'm sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Where can we download the latest data? I believe. I put that in the, yes, if you go to the, um, the questions for the exam, in the very top, there's a URL. Oh, it's right there. Okay, thank you. So, um, a week ago, we started talking about Apache Cassandra, and this is a you know distributed NoSQL database. Um, you know, somewhat popular in the sense that it you can get tremendous throughput, um, you can hold lots of lots of data, um, and here in document twenty two. Right down here, slide 10. Um, <clears throat> you know, all the great things the Apache people claim about Apache Cassandra. And yeah, you know, Apple has a 100,000 node Cassandra cluster. They won't tell us what it's used for. You know, Netflix and Uber use it. Um, and they, you know, have a lot of, a lot of data that run through this thing. And Cassandra, it does not use traditional tables. It's row based. Um, and a row has a primary key. And we'll see later that primary key is used to figure out which node to put that row on. And then there's a bunch of columns. And each column has a label and a value. Oops. Um, oh, yes. And I'm following Cassandra Definitive Guide, second edition. You know, I copied the most diagrams in there. Um, and that's the text I use to understand Cassandra. And if you look at the Cassandra documentation itself, you'll see that um, either he copied a lot from the documentation or the documentation copied from his book or he wrote both. Um, And then I need 
one more thing. Okay. Um, now they do have a concept of a table. The table is just a bunch of rows. Um, the one thing different about Cassandra than a regular database is that each row does not have to have the same columns. All right, so here's the capital table, um, you know, where they've got column one in common, um, but then, you know, columns two and three are in the first row, and column four is in the second row. Rich, if you're a database person, you'll recognize that this um, means you have to worry about what, when you query the data, um, you're going to get different types of things back. Um, now, they talk about wide rows. These are rows that are really big. Um, and a little row can have like they say, you know, millions of columns. You know, it's designed to hold lots of data. Um, this partition key is used to determine which node to store a particular row in. Um, and if you only have, only have, no, we'll leave with that for the moment. And we can also have this idea of clustering columns. Um, and that specifies how the columns are sorted on that particular node. So, okay, so we've got rows and tables consist of rows. Um, we've got a partition key to figure out which node it goes on. Um, and then we can specify some ordering by clustering columns. Um, and the primary key is made up of partition key plus the uh, clustering columns. So much of terms, the column is just, you know, name value pair. Um, you know, rows and container for columns. But Cassandra is not like some databases where they actually store a column as an individual thing, we store it row by row. Um, and the same, different rows in the same table can end up on different machines. Tables, container for rows. Um, now, key space, you can think of that just a, in, a, in a normal database world. You can see the database, so it's a collection of tables. Um, they call it key space. Um, and a cluster, or sometimes they call it a ring, it will contain all your databases of key spaces. And we'll see in a minute why they talk about a ring. Um, yeah, it's, they do follow a lot of conventions that you see in a regular SQL database. So the names of rows and columns and tables are all stored as lowercase, significant for as uppercase. So towards the end of lecture a week ago, someone asked how do we um, You know, talk to Cassandra database. There are a couple ways of doing it. Cassandra comes with a command line client. Um, so you can connect your database and check it out. Um, data Sacks um, is a company that, that was created to um, basically sell Cassandra. They have a proprietary version they support, um, and they also provide 
uh, clients talk to the standard da database in these languages. And we'll see examples of using Python a little bit later. No, so here's some sample interaction using you know, the command line tool. Um, you now first creating a key space, basically creating a database in all terms. Um, and we can specify certain properties. Um, we'll see what the class simple strategy means in a little bit. The replication factor um, tells us um, how many times you want each row to replicate on different machines, um, you know, for fault tolerance. So when one machine goes down, we've got uh, a backup. Um, now we're looking at, you know, I want to use that namespace or key space so that um, I, I don't have to preface everything. Um, you know, you know, tell me about my key space. Oh, did I forget? Um, somehow I lost a page. Um, slide. I created a table called user. And I created a primary key called first name and a another column called last name. So when we create a table in Cassandra, it's slightly different than lots of other NoSQL databases in that we specify a schema for the table. Um, so I'm specifying this, this particular table can have two columns. Um, and then when I ask to describe it, we see all the properties and there's one property I want to point out and there's the bloom filter. Um, you may have some vague recollection that talked about bloom filters earlier on. Um, Cassandra uses it because eventually um, the tables get written to the disk and then they want to know which file to look for and to save time instead of trying to search each file they keep a bloom filter in memory so they can try and figure out where have a quick check to uh, find possible file that contain that role um, an insert statement Right. Again, you notice that they're they're following you know common syntax that you may be used to. Um, and then a select statement to get um, you know select count on everything from that unit. Find out how many things are in there. There's one row. Um, so again, a select statement looks pretty familiar. So we'll pick no SQL, right? Select star from the table where, you know, first name equals something. Um, so at this point, you may be wondering why they call it no SQL. Um, now I'm at, I'm trying to select um, from the table where last name is Whitney and I get this error. Um, and the problem is 
when you create a primary key, um, it, it forms the index of that key, um, so it knows where it is. It sort of find rapidly finds it. Um, now, when I query the last name, there's no index. Um, So it could take a long time searching for um, what that could be. And here we start to see some of the differences in that typically on a regular database, all your tables are in one machine. Um, but Cassandra, each row of a table could be a different machine. Um, so now, um, you know, if I'm on a cluster with say a thousand Cassandra nodes and I ask for this, um, it may have to go through all thousand machines to find out um, where that row is. And if I want to pay the penalty, right, you know, we can add this um, attribute and then we'll do what it needs to do to find the roles and match that query. And we can <clears throat> in an author table. Um, you know, so we have an alternate table. Adding new user, adding new data user. Now you can see I'm getting two rows. Um, and since my information was added to the table before I added the um, third column, you know, I get a null value for that. Another interesting thing about Cassandra is the fact that each time you write a column, that column in that row has a timestamp. <clears throat> and so here I'm, you know, asking for the right time. <clears throat> and the last name each of columns. And we'll see why, why we need that later. Um, <clears throat> again, well, you know, since it's a distributed database system, you know, it turns out when clients connect to it, they all they can connect to different um, nodes, and so you might get two write requests that happen nearly simultaneously, and then they have to propagate through, and then you have to worry about which one um, wins. And if you're a DBA, this will probably drive you nuts. You can actually specify how long the data should survive in the database. Um, so I'm adding this, this user, build temp, um, giving it the time to live to 600 seconds. You know, so I can now select right away, get the information. Um, you know, I then selected everyone and then waited 10 minutes and the data was gone. So we can actually have temporary information in our Cassandra database. The various data types, um, most of them are pretty standard. Um, the ones that stand out are collections. And this is again, um, how Cassandra is going to be different than your normal SQL database. Um, So 
so a set right so here i'm i'm adding to my table an email column and that column will contain a set um right and so then i'm updating myself to add an email address and then i can update again and i'm doing a set operation adding to existing emails new email address and now when i you know select emails from my row we get both of them right so this is in a regular database you wouldn't do this right so we create a separate table for emails and then you have a um You know, foreign key to specify who the email is for, um, and then you do a join to get the data back. Um, in Cassandra, we don't do that. You want to put all the data in one spot. Um, and again, we can, you know, some example using lists. Um, so I create a list, all right? So making phone numbers a list, which might have more than one phone number. Um, right. So, like I said, in a relational database, you wouldn't do this, right? You'd have, you know, a user table, and then each person would have an ID, and then we have an email address table. Right, and then you've got this foreign key to say who the email belongs to, right? The Sandra doesn't do this. Um, it's a distributed database, and each row can be a different different node. So if I have two separate tables, um, then You know, this row um, in that table and that row on this table can be complete, could be on separate machines. To so join them requires network traffic. Um, so instead, we're going to denormalize the database and we're going to put data together um, in a single row. Right, so we denormalize the data um, so that when I want all the email addresses from the user, that data is in this, on the same machine in the same row. Um, so when we do the query, it's that. And we'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, you know, so that gives you, you know, some information how to interact with um, Cassandra using the command line tool. I want to talk about some of the architecture so we understand what a ring is, um, so we understand some of the operations. Um, so Cassandra is aware of um, they group um, things by rack and by data center. So yes, Cassandra, you have a Cassandra cluster that's spread across multiple data centers. Um, and Cassandra is built to handle that. Um, and yeah, the default configuration for distributed Cassandra is having one data center in one rack. Um, but clearly if you've got a 100,000 node cluster it's not all in one rack and it's not all in one data center. Um, Cassandra comes with um, some, some tools it uses. Um, yeah, what they call it? The gossip protocol. Um, and if you've got a 100,000 node cluster, there may be times when some of those machines go down um, or the network goes down or for some reason not reachable. And so they've got this, what they call the 
the gossip protocol, which is going to continually check um, the machines to see which machines are there. And they don't do it in a binary fashion that's either available or not available. Um, they do it in a continuous, so they have all oh, the 40% chance it's available. Um, and then they've got what they call snitches. And the goal here is to figure out uh, which nodes are close to each other um, in the network sense. So which ones are on the same rack? How close are they? Um, and they use that to manage the overall topology again, for, for performance. When you create a Cassandra cluster, um, each node is given a token, which is a 64-bit integer. Um, and each, each node has a different integer. And they then arrange those nodes in a ring based upon that, that token value. Um, and it, it's a ring that wraps around. And and we'll see why this is important in, in a minute. Um, and this is a key, <clears throat> key thing here. Um, basically, what's going to happen is each row has a partition key. And what you do with that part, what Cassandra does with that partition key is it hashes it to a number, um, to a 64-bit integer. And that's going to tell us where to put that row. And it's going to tell us where to find that row. And what they do is, um, you know, say node A1 has a token 500. Then node 1 is going to own all rows that hash to from 0 to 500. Now, for efficiency, what they do is they, they create virtual nodes. Um, and typically, they assign each physical node 256 virtual nodes. And the reason they do that is when data starts there are times when they want to reshuffle data um, to balance things out. And it becomes easier to do that if I can now take a few virtual nodes in one and put it in another one. Um, like I said, this is it, right? Um, each row has a partition key, and that's what the thought you hash that, and that tells you where to put on that row. So far, so good. You know, so here, in the example, this becomes a primary partition key. Um, and whatever that ID is, when I create it, it tells us where it goes. Um, now I can create a primary key and a clustering key. Um, so what this is telling us is the ID tells me where to, which node to put it on. And right, the clustering key tells me when I store a row there, I sort, you know, I I sort things by that field. And then we can create more complicated um, keys if we want. OK, now the um, replication factor. Um,
you know, what happens when the multiplication factor is larger than one? That means each row is being stored more than once. So where do we store it? Um, there's a couple of strategies. The simple strategy is say the replication factor is n. Um, I then store that node, that I replicate it, uh, and I store them in the next n nodes. And I assume that means the next n physical nodes as opposed to virtual nodes. But I did not look that up. Um, There's also a network topology strategy, um, which allows you to, to um, you know, specify different replication factors per data center, if you wish. And inside a single data, data center, it replaces replicas in different racks. Um, Now, of course, we have to remember the CAP theorem, which basically says um, we can't have everything that we do in a normal database. And so what Cassandra does is it relaxes the consistency levels. Um, and there are various consistency levels we can have. Um, and we can specify it. Um, per connection or per query. Um, so we can specify on the right how many nodes must confirm the right before we consider it to be written. Um, and the same thing for reads, we specify how many um, nodes have to return that value before we specify, we assume that we have the right value. And again, this is done to help deal with the, the theory of nature. Um, so then we get all these fun questions. What happens if one of the replicas is down? or not available when we do a write, um, then comes back online. Um, you know, what happens? Um, so what they do is, um, when the replica is not available and you do a write, um, the node that, that gets a request then stores what they call a hint. And when that replica comes back up online and more available, they then send that write request to the node. Um, and then you have to worry about how do we deal with this nodes of transient values. Um, Cassandra stores this information both in memory. Um, you know, so these parts are in memory and these are on disk. Um, so it, it, it follows a um, Kafka model when you first do a write. Um, the first thing it does is it, it adds that command to the commit log. So um, before it does anything else that way, you, if the machine goes down, we can replay the log. Um, and then it adds it to what they call the mem tables, the tables in memory. Um, and then when the mem tables get too large, they write those mem tables to what they call the SS tables on this. Um, they then clear the mem table, so it's empty. Um, and then they mark all those com the commands as in the logs. And then, and then on, whenever the request comes in those rows, 
they have to go into disk um, to find it. And that's why they use um, you know, in memory caches. Um, on writes, um, like I said, it's store hints. Um, so the replica is not available, we store the hint on the node that gets the request so it can be replicant replicated and comes back online. Um, when you do a read, um, the client specifies the consistency level they want. Um, so if they specify they want 10 nodes, to, replicas to um, actually confirm the read and you come back with nine values that are consistent and 10th values are wrong. Um, if, it, if we need to, we will um, update the replicas for continuing. However, if we get 10 values the same and two values off and they only wanted 10 values to confirm, then we'll confirm the data to the client and in the background we'll then update the out-of-date um, replicas. And which values are to date? How do they know which values are to date, right? Um, so when I do a read and I get 10 values the same and two other values were different, how do we know that the two values that are different are not the right most current values, right? Anyone have an idea? how they can do that, or how they do that. Use a log? No. Um, if I'm getting 12 values back I'm, and I'm talking to 12 different machines, those are going to be 12 different logs. Um, remember each row, each column that you write has a timestamp on it. So we can use that timestamp to try and figure out um, which one's more recent. And when we do a read, um, we check the mem table, see if it's in there. If it's not, then we use a boom filter to determine which one of these tables it contains. Um, and they've got several algorithms they use to actually um, check for um, repairs when they're the other date. Um, one is on read repair, that is when you do a read, they check and they look at all the values again back and if they're not the same, then the ones out of date or get up, will be updated either before we finish doing the read or after we do the read. But there are some other algorithms they use to go through the database periodically and There's also, you have to keep in mind the difference between the replication factor and the consistency level. The replication factor is how many times each row is going to be duplicated. And the consistency level is how many nodes we want to confirm the write or the read when we actually do requests. Um, and we can do that you know, either when the client connects or we can do it per request. And we'll see how to do that very shortly. Uh, 
how to write you work. Um, the client can basically connect to any of the nodes in the cluster, and that becomes what they call a local coordinator. Um, if the cluster is spread across different data centers, that node then will contact the other data centers, and, and each data center will have a remote coordinator, um, which will then remote coordinator is going to contact um, replicas on there and return results back to the main node. Um, now, if the, if the client says, I want, you know, 10 replicas to report back before I consider this to be written for consistency level, the only five nodes are available, replicas are available, then um, the write fails immediately. If there are enough replicas up to satisfy the consistency request of the client, we send a write to all replicas. Um, and we don't wait for all of them to report back, we only wait until we get um, a sufficient number of replies from replicas if they're done, um, to satisfy the client request for consistency, and then, and then tell the client that the write was completed. Um, and if any replica doesn't respond back in a timeout period, we mark it as not being available and store a hint. On a particular machine, um, the first thing you do is you add that right to the log, um, and then you add that table to the mem table, and right, if the row was in your, your cache, you invalidate the cache, um, and then you worry about whether the mem table is too big. And if you're the coordinator, you have to worry about saving hints for replicas that did not respond in time. Okay. Yeah, so you know, you have the Kafka like strategy of you know using logs to store requests. Um, and you keep memory right. Yeah, some more details. Um, you know, we can do, if not exists. Um, so we don't overwrite existing data. We do it a second time, you get a false, and you get the data returning that you tried to insert with poverty there. Um, now to look at um, the Python driver. Um, you know, so it's again, you've got an import, we need to get a cluster. Um, you know, what key store or database we want to talk to, um, and then we can execute our statements. And we get back a row object, um, a result set, and the result set can only be read once. Um, so here's an example of, you know, Selecting everything in the table and then printing it out. And we get row objects. And you get all the data in the row object. Um, 
we can index those row objects by the labels of the columns. We can also do it by location. Um, We can create you know, a statement object, um, execute it, and that allows us to add more information. Here I'm telling you how, how many rows we want to fetch at a time. Um, here I'm specifying um, consistency level. And since I only had one node, I can only set to one if I said higher complaint their message. They have prepared statements. Um, works pretty much. Um, syntax is similar to SQL. We have a question mark. Um, and then we have to we execute the statement. We have to specify the value. The advantage of doing this is performance um, because when you have a prepared statement, Cassandra stores that prepared statement on the database. So when you start sending data, you don't have to parse that statement a second time and you only have to send the data to uh, Cassandra. The big difference um, between SQL database and Cassandra is your data modeling. And that is in a regular database, um, you then you try and analyze what your data is going to be, how it's going to be structured, and then you go through all these various um, rules of normalization to normalize your data and break table further further. Um, in Cassandra, when you're creating your database, the first thing you do is ask what queries do you want to do? Um, what questions do you, want to, do you want to answer? And then you create, for each query, you want to make sure you create a table or table or a table that contains the data for the given query. That means data will be duplicated, right? Um, so for example, if in my user table, I stored names, well, if I want to look up someone's, I want to look up someone's phone by name, okay, I'm gonna put all their phones in the same row as their name. Um, but what happens then? want to do a verse lookup, right? I have the number, how do I get the name? Um, we're going to create another table and it's going to be indexed by the phone number and then we're going to put the person's name. So we have two separate tables, right? Um, to support those two different queries. And those two tables are going to replicate the data. If you're taking a course on databases, um, I'm sure you can just imagine your instructor complaining about marking you down because you didn't normalize your tables. Well, in Cassandra, you want to avoid normalizing um, your tables and do just the opposite. Which leads to um, a question that is, if I'm going to duplicate data, how do I make sure I enter in the multiple places it's supposed to be? Um, that's where batches come in. Um, so at batch, we can submit multiple um, inserts, updates, or deletes. And these operations are a batch of atomics, either they're all 
done or none are done. So now I can add, um, I'm going to add a new user with a new phone number. I can add it to the user table. At the same time, I can add the same information to right, the phone table, which is indexed by telephone numbers. Any questions so far? It's a lot of detail. Now we're in a position to do some really interesting things. Um, unfortunately, the semester is almost over and everyone's exhausted um, because they have all these projects and exams and to do. Um, but first, um, last week, a couple of people on their projects, or at least one person, was talking about computing um, our value for COVID um, virus. Um, and I said I, I look up um, the website which showed how to do it um, over time. And a couple of days ago, um, this site um, went live. Um, the URL is pretty simple. It was created by two of the people who started Instagram. And what they do is, for all 50 states, they tried to compute the R value, which is the, how, how infectious uh, of COVID-9 has been over time. Um, so for example, in the bottom here, we've got um, the infectious rate of uh, COVID-9 in California and the reproduction rate, if it's one, it's basically, you know, it's basically the same level and the above one means it's spreading because one person is infecting more than one person. Um, and so in California, you can see it goes up and down. Um, and, you know, you know, in April, we've sort of gone up and down across one sort of times. Um, New York, you can see it had a huge spike. Um, and then they have a table of all the different states and where they currently are today. Um, you know, some of these states are, which will be growing quite fast. But if you're interested in how to compute um, our value over time, you want to go to this website and if you scroll down the bottom, there's a link to the, um, Jupyter Notebook where they actually do the computation to compute our value based on time. And I will warn you, it is a complicated um, computation. Okay. Remember when I talked about the very, very beginning of the course, long time, it seems even longer now um, with all this stay at home. Um, you know, big data, we talk about large data sets. Um, you know, so we can use Spark and clusters to deal with that. Um, the velocity of you know, data the streams. And we've got Kafka for that. Um, and we talked about variety of different formats, 
structured unstructured um, USQL. Uh, this some NoSQL databases deal with this easier than Cassandra. But Cassandra deals with it um, in variability and veracity, right? Um, now we've got Spark, we have Kafka, we have Cassandra, um, complexity. A brief diversion talking about microservices. Microservice is just a collection of small little services that you put together to make it an application. Um, each service runs on its own process. They're usually use a couple you deploy and test them independently. And typically you want to build each service from a small business capability. Um, microservices are pretty trendy right now. Here are some references you can go look at them or read more about them. So now I want, I've been talking about this sort of example of we've got a store, it's like Walmart, and they want to track in real time the sales, right? Um, so I want to do an example where I have a bunch of stores, right? Doing lots of business and they want to then record um, their sales, right? So what we can do is, okay, every time the store sells something, we can then have the store, you know, by some process, put that into a Kafka stream, and then we can um, have a consumer at the other end of Kafka, and we can pull that data out and put in Cassandra. Now there's, a, you know, typically you, you don't want your clients writing directly to the database because that means they have to know how to log into the database, um, which is a security risk. Um, and there's some other reasons for that too, but we'll see another one in a moment. Um, so what we know now, we could have a we could set up a Kafka cluster, cluster um, have our stores write to it, and then pull it off from the Cassandra database. Of course, now if we want to do some real time analytics to see what's going on, um, we saw earlier, I may not remember this, but we saw an example of where Spark can take as an input a Kafka stream, right, and do some processing on it. Um, so now what we can do is the store is pouring um, all its sales into a Kafka topic. Um, and the topic, um, we're taking things out of the topic and writing into Cassandra. At the same time, Spark will read from that topic, uh, doing some processing, uh, maybe computer an average sale per hour. Um, and then we're going to write that um, into a different topic in the, the Kafka. Um, um, cluster, and then the output that we can also store in Cassandra. Um, since the data is already in Cassandra, we may, may not want that data to stay very long, so we can make it temporary, have it last in a couple of days. And then um, we may want to visualize that in real time. So again, I can create a you create a web application that is reading, going to the Kafka um, topic and reading values out. Um, and when I did this, um, I thought this application Tableau, which I'll talk about on Thursday, could read real time Kafka data, but I was mistaken. Um, you can do some other screens, not Kafka. Um, so now what we have is 
small pieces, right? We've got stores writing to a Kafka, Kafka topic. Um, we've got a Spark program reading from the topic. We've got another little program which is going to take it out of the topic and put it into the database. Um, we've got a web app which is reading from the set topic, right? Um, another little application independent which is storing it in Cassandra. So we get this whole workflow, right? But there's not one big program that's doing it. We've got, you know, little programs here, um, putting into Kafka. We've got a little program here, reading to Cassandra. Another one reading to Cassandra. Another program here, taking out a Kafka. Another one for Spark. So we've got, you know, each store has its programs. So there's, and then there's one, two, three, four other programs working in this whole application. Um, right? Um, now, one thing I didn't tell you about Kafka, it has what they call Kafka streams. And a Kafka stream reads from a, a Kafka topic, you do some processing on it, and then write to another Kafka topic. Um, and it will run on the Kafka cluster um, so it can scale. Um, and they support you know, basically in a JVM language. Um, unfortunately, Python is not a JVM language. You know, so here's an example of, you know, it's a Kafka stream doing the, the, the famous word count problem. Serializers, here's my input stream, it's going to read from the Kafka stream of that topic. And then, you know, doing, you know, standard, you know, flat map group by count. And then, um, you know, I'm writing to help us. I'm writing to a particular um, another Kafka topic. That's it. And then, so again, a small little program we can use to um, do some processing on these streams on this Kafka topic. They also have what they call Kafka Connect, and we can use Kafka Connect to um, put data into a Kafka topic and take and take it out of the topic and, and store it and you know send it to another program. Um, and again, we can it runs on a cluster, so it's scalable. Um, there's a REST interface to allow you to actually manage it, um, and again, it's fairly simple to. Simple, straightforward, you have to do some configuration, write some code, and we're creating you know small parts of the program to process, do one small step in this this chain. Um, so literally to create this um, example, right, we can now have you know Kafka connect object to do this. Right, another Kafka connect to do this. Um, I can replace this with just a Kafka stream, and I can use a Kafka connect to you know go into the database, and another one to go into my web app. So it gives us the ability to start putting together these pieces into a larger system. And I did it using Python. And we'll, so next time I will look at um, how to do that. Um, 
And we'll end here. I suspect a number of people are going to jump back on looking at the exam, or you've been only listening with one ear to me talk. We're working on your exam now, so you'll be glad I'm going to stop talking. Yeah, we can, you can create a Kafka connect to take things out of Kafka database, Kafka topic and put it into a regular database, sure. You get time for one more quick question. So and you're coming up, so we will end class here and see people on Thursday. Thank you, Professor.